Kaluru. So today we are going to deal with the topic in linguistics regarding words, word stress, and syntax. And today is a really very important session because today we will be dealing with uh, different aspects of the syntax regarding whether it be syntactic constituents or the phrase structure. So today's session is really quite uh, interesting and quite knowledgeable. So I would request the participant to make the best out of the session and be attentive and do ask your queries by the end of the session. So I would request Arun sir to kindly start the session. Thank you, sir. Oh, thank you. People have joined already? Uh, yes, sir. Almost 16 have joined. Okay, okay. Okay, good morning everybody. Uh, as uh, Heba ma'am introduced uh, uh, now and in course of her introduction, she also told you that we would be uh, having syntax and accent. Uh, word stress, accent and all those I have done on a couple of occasions also in the previous classes. But today I will be dealing with them uh, in greater detail. Uh, basically because this would possibly be my last class with you. Uh, and uh, the, the rules of uh, stress and how to, how to put uh, word stress where and how they affect or change the meaning of, of a word or the function of a word and all those things we will uh, look at them in greater detail. In the next one hour and a, and a quarter or so, we will do maybe our first 10, 15 minutes on syntax and the remaining 45 minutes or one hour on word accent and maybe last 5, 10 minutes we'll leave for, leave the floor open for questions and answers. Uh, you, uh, I can assure you one thing, that by the end of the class you would have uh, got every single uh, doubt that you would have uh, foreseen or apprehended even, be, even before joining this uh, class. But in case, uh, by whatever uh, reasons you still have questions, you can note them down and then uh, write them in the chat box and I'll try to respond to each of those questions in the limited time available to us. All right? Uh, we are good to go? Okay. Uh, syntax, uh, uh, a, a brief uh, about syntax also I had given introduction in the last class on second I think second of June uh, but let's let's see uh, what it means and how it what its role is in linguistics and phonetics now when we say uh, linguistics linguistics is a study of language we are talking of English linguistics here we are not dealing with any other language study and in that again there are so many uh, branches of linguistics one of them is Let's say your sociolinguistics, your psycholinguistics, your stylistics, and all those. And syntax is a is an important aspect of, of language of any language study, and because the it it binds the words together. If you uh, know words are the building blocks, are the uh, smallest units of sentences. In terms of phonetics, of course, uh, phonemes and all those syllables and phonemes and all those. But I'm talking of uh, as a sentence structure or as a paragraph. So, uh, words are the building blocks. They, you combine those words and then get sentences. Now, one of the uh, conditions or the criteria necessary for having a sentence is that it must have words. May have one word, may have um, uh, more, but ordinarily we don't have a one word sentence unless of course in exceptional cases uh, something like yes and no and come and go, but those are uh, not sentences, they, they cannot be construed as, they cannot be accepted as sentences basically because they are, uh, they cannot be considered in isolation. They are with, with regard to something, in relation to something else. When somebody, when you seek somebody's permission, may I come in sir, he or she asks you to come in, yes, and uh, that's, that's it. Or for that matter to any yes or no type question, we, our response is either yes or no. We do not explain. If somebody asks us, did you have your breakfast today? We say yes or no. We don't say, well, I had breakfast, I wanted to eat idli, but it was not tasty and fluffy. So I ended up eating uh, corn flakes, but uh, we didn't have milk. We had run out of milk. And in the COVID, we couldn't go out to buy milk. We don't have to give all those explanations. The basic answer is just yes or no, 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 or yes. 
Now, but then, but then one thing is clear that all the uh, everybody is able to hear me. Hello. Yes, sir. Ah, very good, very good. So, uh, in 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 isolation, we they they cannot they may be accepted as sentences, but not in. Uh, not uh, sorry in context they may be sentences but not in isolation which is why they are not second second thing is when we combine those sentences and words 2 3 4 20 words also and form a sentence strings of words we call them strings of words 3 4 words together but then they follow a structure there are rules and in, in our daily life also we follow so many rules let's say when you walk along the when you go to college or when you go to office when you go to some place shopping we have to follow so many rules. So, if you are driving, go to the left of the, uh, drive along the left. If you are walking, walk along the pedestrian path or food path. If, if you are uh, standing at a, at a shop, if you buy something and standing at a shop to bill, to pay the bill, stand in queue. These days, that has become all the more important of, uh, for the social distancing norms. So, uh, there are rules and here also those rules follow, we follow those rules, so we string those words together, make them sentences. Now, when we follow, when we put those words together, we cannot just put them in any manner we like. There are, there are norms, there are, there are rules, there are fixed uh, rules that govern uh, in forming the sentences. So, uh, the, in English for instance, the rules are SVO, subject, verb and object. Subject may may consist of nouns and or pronouns then they are preceded by uh, uh, adjectives and articles or determiners then all all those things put together they become subject then you have verb verb can be a single word like go it can it can be a, a in the in the tense for instance when you change the tense present progressive tense for instance depending on the number of the subject it becomes is going or was going or where dancing so that's the verb so if you have a b type verb is am are was where the verb takes an ing and that that becomes one part verb or have been going we have been living in sambalpur for the last 20 years so have been staying have been living so that's those those three words form the verb then last part is object you may have one object you may have two objects you may have zero object uh, of course, when you don't have any object, that's the, the verb is intransitive, so it doesn't require any object. Say, for example, dance. We we dance or dream or hop or jump, or all those uh, or sing. In all those things, we don't need an object. But then there are there are verbs which necessarily need object because they are transitive verbs. And when we talk of those transitive verbs, they need an object. The object also will may have the components that we have in the subject it, it may have an adjective may have a may have a, a determiner or an article then the root word noun or pronoun and then that's how it so let's say in a in a sentence like in a sentence like let's say ram killed ravana so ram is a subject is the subject here killed is verb simple past tense and then of the ravana is object ram because a uh, is, is the it starts the sentence any any word that begins a sentence must have a capital letter and also here it's a, anyway it's a proper noun and therefore it must have a capital letter also so that's how it's a capital letter so ram killed and the ravana ravan again is a proper noun and therefore it will have a it will take a capital letter and then it stops there because it's a statement all statements or assertive sentences or declarative declarative sentences take uh, they end in a full stop. We call them period also or dot also. Period, full stop, stop, dot, all those are right. All of them are the same thing. So, full stop. Full stop, the purpose of a full stop, one of the basic functions of, uh, of the full stop is that it terminates the sentence, terminates the idea. If you say Ram killed Ravana, that you terminate the sentence there. Next sentence will be something like he, okay, he was the king of uh, Lanka. So, if you say he was the king of Lanka, he becomes the pronoun of the noun. Pronoun, if you uh, all of you are aware, must be aware, is, is something that is used in place of a noun. And that the function is the same. It also does the function as the noun does. So, here 
in place of Ravana, Ram, you said he. And then he was the king of our... So that's, that's how he... And then, because it's a past tense, so therefore you say he uh, was. And then king and all those things, right? So prince of... And, and then, then you have, in place of Ram or Ravana or, or he, if you use... If, if you want to expand, let's say something like uh, a tall man, a white tall man, a white black tall man, a white black tall American man, a white, uh, a white tall India born American man, a, to a white tall India born American businessman, a tall white in India born American white man living in California. Now all those things, the whole thing can be, can be considered as, as just noun. It, it can be replaced by just a word like he or James or something. So just one word. Here we are giving all these words to describe that man. So he, he is an Indian origin. He is a tall man. He is white. He, is, uh, he was born in India. He lives in America, in California. And he has a business. He runs a business. All those things we are using to make these sentences to, to show how a strings of words, a string of words can form uh, a, a component, an aspect, and that can be also replaced by one single word like he or John's. Okay. So that's that's uh, the subject part. And then you have verb. Verb also, whatever single you can have a simple verb like we go to office. So go. Or he has been staying in Sambalpur for the last 20 years. Has been staying. Has been and then stay ing. So that has been staying also is a verb. And then finally, last, last in Sambalpur. Then you put a comma there, Sambalpur, and then one of the, uh, one of the uh, big cities, big towns in western Orissa are known for uh, the Hirakus Dam something. So, if you go on expanding that also, the whole thing can be considered as one part or one unit, like ob in, in the first case it was subject, in this case it is object. So, subject, verb, object. In case you have two objects, we, we are not talking about a sentence where you don't have object now, because we are talking of uh, subject, verb and object. If you don't have an object, that becomes an intransitive verb and therefore that will be he, he swims, he is swimming, he has been swimming. So, the rules will stay there, but in this case, you go on expanding, object. So, one object, then two objects. If you have two objects, one of them becomes either direct object, the other one is indirect object. If, if you have a, a sentence where you have two objects, so uh, we gave him uh, a box. We gave him a box. Now, we is subject, gave is verb, him is object number one, or box is object number two. Then. <coughs> If, if, you, uh, if, if you don't have any object, then uh, it's, it's like uh, he swims. They, they are dancing. The, the children ha uh, have been shouting. Children have been shouting. So, children is noun, subject, the children, and have been shouting. The whole thing is verb. You don't have any object there. So, that's subject, verb, object in syntax. And syntax makes us, uh, gives us the the set of rules, how to frame sentences, how to get them right, subject, verb, agreement is one of them. If the number is singular in the subject component, number is singular, and then tense is the whatever verb is used, if the verb is present tense or past tense, depend, let's say present tense, first let's talk of present tense. So, if the verb is present tense, and the number is singular in the subject, singular, present tense, and if the person person involved in this subject, so that's the third person, he, he or, or uh, Bill Clinton, so that's third person singular. Third person singular in the present tense, takes S or ES, so we say he visits America next month, he visits India this week, so he visits, that's the third person, that's subject verb agreement. Similarly, one of my friends is uh, is affected by COVID, let us say. So, one of my friends, that's a singular number because we are talking of one. Out of those so many friends, I have 100 friends. Out of 100, one of them. So, uh, that's why it's a singular number. 
one of my friends is suffering from or is affected by COVID. So, that is because this number is singular therefore, it takes a singular verb uh, is that is another another uh, rule another thing subject verb agreement. Similarly, either or either or also takes a singular thing that is that is because either either Sambalpur or Rorkela will get a COVID hospital. So, either or you are giving a choice it is not both if there is both then it will be plural both Sambalpur and Raurkela are big towns in western Odisha. So, they are because both are uh, you are taking into account both and therefore, they become plural number is more than one, but in this case either or you are eliminating one at the expense of the other and therefore, it becomes a singular. So, if you say either Sambalpur or Raurkela it is one and therefore, one always takes a singular verb. So, one either this either Sambalpur or Raurkela is going to get or has got a COVID hospital. So, that is why that is another rule that governs subject verb agreement. Second one is it is an important tool for writers because they create various rhetorical or literary effects. Now, syntax is an important thing because it helps writers, it helps authors, it helps examinees, it helps students, it helps academics everybody to, to uh, create rhetorical speeches or rhetorical effects to give rhetorical effects to writing. If you say something like rhetorical question one example of rhetorical question is something like this who is there who can say no to my command. Let us say in your class uh, when when you attend physical classes not in I am not talking of OSOU open university classes it is virtual classes you are at your home you uh, if you are not comfortable if you do not want to see the teacher's face you can always uh, switch off your camera if you do not want to listen to somebody you can always mute your mic if you do not want to uh, if you do not want to speak to somebody you can mute your mic and that is all those possibilities are there. I am talking of a real uh, brick and wall brick and mortar classroom if, when we are doing your high school or BA or uh, plus two and all those. What happened there in a, in a class let us say you made a noise or you made some disturbance or you created some nuisance what would happen teacher would bark at you teacher would shout at you who, who is who is this who is that boy who is the student who who did this who who threw the uh, who threw a paper ball uh, at, at me. So, nobody nobody gets up nobody will say out of 60 boys and girls nobody will say sir I did it. So, but, but what happens the teacher teacher will then get infuriated and he will he or she will say who, who, who is that student who uh, who did this I will throw him out of this class I will I will report him to principal kind of thing. So, who is who is that who can say no to my command if you say get out and if you uh, defy he or she will say who can say no to my command now that is a rhetorical question he does not he does not expect a response to your his question telling ok sir I am there I do not want right nobody does that. Then another uh, one, another thing in uh, in uh, linguistics that another function of linguistics in syntax that because it, it provides a set of rules one set of rules um, six seven rules whatever and that determines the arrangement of words in a sentence. So, we know that this is how sentences have to be formed in English. In other languages in Odia for instance if you write in Odia or speak in Odia we say or in Hindi we say hum hum uh, hum ok we, we go to temples let us say hum uh, devasthanam jate hai hum, hum mandir jate hai hum mandir jate hai hum is what subject Mandir is verb uh, object I am sorry Ham is subject we Mandir is temples which is object and then Jate hai is verb subject object verb in English subject verb object we go to temples we eat rice they they are writing examinations they are writing examinations they is subject are writing is verb examinations is object right O Pariksha dekh rahe hai O is subject they pariksha is examination object and then verb is are writing. So, that is how the order changes uh, in when it comes to language uh, English and any other language in English it is subject verb object it is fixed it is rigid you cannot change that ha huh. only only possibility only option that you have uh, as a writer to change the style and structure in English defy the rules of English 
uh, like whatever Chomsky and all those grammarians uh, fix, is that you can say, I am doing this, I am using what? Poetic license. I have poetic license, so I am using these, these words or this structure or these uh, uh, manners because I have got poetic license. Which is why you don't have to follow subject, verb, order, or agreement, you don't have to put a capital letter uh, at the beginning of a sentence, you don't have to put a stop at the end of a statement, you don't have to put a question mark at the uh, end of a uh, question, set, interrogative sentence and all those. We have uh, very few poets in English, in fact I, I know of only one gentleman, E. E. Cummings. E. E. Cummings, C-U-M-M-I-N-G-S. That gentleman wrote everything in lowercase letters, small letters, including his name. Even his name also, he would write in small letters, the poetry that he would compose also write in everything, including the first line of, uh, first, uh, each line of the, of, of the uh, poem, of whatever poem is composed, each line, uh, the first letter of each line also would be uh, lowercase. That, that's, an, that's the only exception I know of, and uh, otherwise the standard rule is that in poetry, prose, English, whatever you compose, it has to, in poetry especially, the first line, the first letter of each line has to start with a capital letter, irrespective of whether it's a complete sentence or not, unlike prose. In prose we have to have, every, at the end of a sentence, a sentence terminates, next sentence starts with a capital letter, of course there are Again, uh, proper nouns and all those also, they take capital letters, they, are, they use capital letters. Right, now coming to uh, the second, uh, the, the, some rules, let's, let's, have a, let's have a glance at the rules, quick glance at the uh, rules. The complete sentence requires subject and verb and it expresses a complete thought, we, we call independent clause, Com complete thought. While, while going to college, I uh, I saw a, a fire tender. Now, I saw a fire tender is a complete uh, clause, is, is a complete sentence, is a complete, is a part of a sentence which is also equal to a sentence, it is a clause which is also equal to a sentence. So a clause by definition can be less than or equal to a sentence. In this case it is equal to a sentence, while going to office I saw a fire tender. So I saw a fire tender is a clause that is also a sentence. So a clause is less than or equal to, in this case it is equal to the first case, while going to college is less than a sentence, that is not a complete sentence. You need to do something to make it complete, either remove that while or add something else, then only it becomes a complete sentence. So that is the first rule. Second one is, separate ideas generally require separate sentences. Like uh, ideally when we compose a paragraph or when we write a, a passage, each, each paragraph contains one idea or thought. Sentence also the same, same idea, same principle holds true for sentences also. Each sentence is independent. But then, if you are, if it's a part of a paragraph, then every sentence can't be independent. It has to be a part of the whole, whole paragraph, whatever idea the whole paragraph contains. So it must have some relationship, some, some connect between sentences, and therefore one sentence must uh, seamlessly. Uh, move over to the next sentence, to the following sentence, and therefore they become a part of a of one unit or one paragraph. Third is English word order, subject, verb, object, object. If you have two objects, if you have one object, it's one S V O. If you don't have any object, it's S V. But then order is constant S V. You don't have, you can't have V S and all those. I am talking of statements and other kind of imperative, yeah, declarative sentences, statements, or assertive sentences. In question sentence, rules are different. We are, we are not talking of those rules because we, we don't take question sentences to, to show how these rules uh, give the uh, function of a sentence. Then the next uh, is a dependent clause contains a subject and a verb. It doesn't express a complete thought. Dependent clause, which is dependent on, the, on uh, something else. It's not independent. It can't it can't stand in isolation, it can function without the support of something else or some more, some more sentence or some more, uh, one more part, one more clause or something else. It can't stand on its own. It needs the support, it needs one more clause or one more idea or, or one more, uh, uh, one more uh, strings of uh, things to make it appear to be 
sentence to, to function as an independent entity. Now, when we uh, a, a part of a, a sentence which is a clause which is not independent, which means a dependent clause, cannot stand on, it, on its own. It has to depend on something. And name also, uh, name suggests so. It cannot stand on its own. It needs somebody else's support. It needs the support of one more part, one more uh, clause, or one more thing to, to appear to be complete. Otherwise, it can't be complete. There are, there are varieties of sentence types in English. There are, basically, there are four types, simple, compound, complex and compound complex. A simple sentence, simple sentences are those they are made up of a simple independent clause, one single clause, one independent clause. So let's say we <coughs> we eat rice, Sambal is a big city. Uh, they uh, they are they are working hard. COVID has taken the world uh, ha has brought the world to its knees. Now all those are simple sentences, one single clause. You don't have too many clauses, you don't have one. Uh, in, the, in the traditional English grammar, we used to have, uh, we use, instead of subject, verb, and object, we used to have uh, noun phrase and verb phrase, or, or uh, subject and predicate. Subject would, would basically consist of noun, uh, nouns, and, and those nouns also would have, would have something like adjectives, and then the articles, the and determinants, and, and the other part, the second part, verbs onwards, we call verb phrase or predicates, they would have verb plus something else. So th those were two. Now to, to make things simpler, to make things, uh, uh, to, to see things in their perspective, we have, we have brought modern grammar has made it into three, subject, verb, and object, if you have any. If you don't have, then it stops at object. Right. So simple sentence has one single clause, one simple clause, one independent clause. So the girl hit the ball. They, they are watching a match. We uh, we are suffering from COVID. So all these are sim simple sentences. A compound sentence is a mixture of, compound as you know is a mixture made up of, it's, it's made up of two or more clauses. Now th there, are, there are two conditions. First thing is it must be made up of two or more independent clauses. Second condition is must be joined by a conjunction, and, or, but, so, and all those. Now having, having two clauses and they getting joined by uh, a conjunction like and and or and or but would make it an would make it a compound sentence so examples are something like something like this uh, the girl hit the ball and the ball flew out of the park they they made a lot of noise so so the gardener so the security asked them to get out the the teacher taught taught the subject uh, in the class and everybody listen to him so these are all compound sentences uh, so and or or joined by all these conjunctions the third type of sentence this this i am talking in terms of function and form we divide when we talk of language it can have form and function when you have uh, form it will be structure and all those so clause we are talking of clause also simple clause one clause two clauses and all those and function because a simple a simple sentence talks of something very simple idea a compound thing has, has more than two ideas more than two things two pieces of information if you have a simple if you have a compound complex the idea also is complex and that's how we can we can make out from the name complex sentence consists of one independent clause and one or more dependent clause one independent clause that's the first condition the other one can be either an independent or a dependent clause and they are not necessarily, they need not necessarily uh, be joined with a conjunction and or and all those. In the other case, it's, it's necessary. They have to be have. In this case, they don't. So, uh, like, and, and uh, when you put those sentences, the clauses together, independent and subordinate, coordinate and all those, independent clause and another clause, that the second clause can be independent or dependent. Uh, can be uh, the first clause has to be independent second one one or more it can be one it can be more than one so two also they have to be uh, de dependent and they don't need a conjunction so example would be uh, when the girl hit the ball the the fans cheered so it's 
the second clause in this case you have one one independent clause the other one is a dependent clause and they are not joined with the joined by a conjunction third and fourth sentence fourth kind of fourth type of sentence is fourth kind of sen fourth kind of sen sentence is compound complex it will have the features of both compound and complex it it consists of multiple independent clauses it one uh, two or more may have two may have more and and the other one is a dependent clause now independent clause you may have one or more and also dependent clause you may have one or more and they are joined together they are put together sentence would be something like this one example would be okay when the girl hit the ball the fans cheered and the ball went out of the park so there are three clauses when the girl hit the ball is one clause the fans cheered is another clause and the ball went out of the park is the clause number three so all those three clauses are combined together to give us a compound complex sentence so what are the what are the functions what are the roles of what does syntax do in literature we are talking of language all this while we are talking of language that okay it gives you it helps you frame sentences it tells you what to use what depending on the number of the subject uh, and the tense of the verb uh, you use all those so that's those were relating those had some relationship with language not talking of literature uh, because when we when we read or write that's also a part of literature we write something we read something uh, that's also part of literature and when we uh, for that we need we need syntax syntax use of syntax in literature now what do we do number one it produces rhetorical and aesthetic effects it, it gives you it gives your language some shape some it sounds good it looks good everybody know you 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 love to read that so when when for instance uh, somebody like uh, somebody like charles dickens for instance in his novel uh, in uh, uh, in one of his iconic novels he said uh, i i think uh, charles dickens he uh, huh, some somebody says he says there are there are good times there are bad times and also that's how it starts there are good times there are bad times there are parallel structures but then they give you in they give you an idea of how two two opposite things can be placed together can be juxtaposed together to give you the effect so you know there are good times and there are bad times and then you follow so uh, or or similarly when uh, when rudyard kipling says somewhere or all those know they give us uh, they give us the effect then uh, aesthetic and uh, two two effects two kinds of effects one is rhetorical that you you feel good that you it asks a question it has rhetoric it has it it makes you it makes the reading of that literature uh, no it, it it makes you it it feels like you you are flowing through it and the other one is aesthetic it looks beautiful it looks lovely you can you can solitary reaper for instance when you read that you 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 feel that physically you feel that somebody is actually uh, cutting grass uh, and then you are wishing or or when uh, Wordsworth says daffodils uh, you know, ten thousand saw at a glance you you feel that you you are actually visualizing those uh, uh, daffodils large number of daffodils he didn't count it at ten thousand one two three four and then ten thousand but then the the amount the number of flowers that he saw at a time it was so you know, astounding that he he it, it's spontaneous. He said, ten thousand saw I at a glance." The other thing I was telling you uh, at the uh, start of this lecture that uh, poetic license here, he, Wordsworth doesn't follow. I saw ten thousand daffodils. He doesn't say that. He says, ten thousand saw I at a glance." That's again because of the the, the change in the word order. Uh, he doesn't follow any syntax. He doesn't follow any syntactic structure. But still, that's one of the most beautiful poem uh, poems in literature in English literature. That's that's he he uses that uh, poetic license, right? But in in our examinations, in our uh, when we write exams and essays in English in test, we can't use that poetic license and then say I have used poetic license. And so whatever you feel is mistake is a uh, wrong syntax structure or a grammatical lack of grammar or uh, syntax and number and uh, subject for agreement. No, we can't escape that because we are doing it as a formal. Uh, writing as a part of our assessment and examination right they were poets they are writers and they can afford to do that we can't 
Second one is, uh, second use of syntax in literature is it controls pace and mood. Now, how, how fast you want to go, how slow you want to go, you, you want to sleep, you want to move slowly, you want to move really fast. Uh, so, there, there it, it determines the speed and mood. In, uh, let us say, in that, in that daffodil uh, Wordsworth, when he says 10,000 saw at a glance, you would, you would feel like, you would feel like waiting, uh, standing there, stopping there, and then have a look at the, at the uh, beauty of the flowers. Or Robert Frost, when he says uh, that uh, in, uh, in uh, what, what is that, Fro Frost, uh, Frost's uh, poetry, he was standing at a forest, and the lake was frozen and all those, there you feel like standing and then looking at the, admiring at the beauty of the nature. So, but somewhere, somewhere else, you may have to run, you may have to gallop, you may have to uh, speed past the uh, events because you don't want that. You, you rather escape that, that sight. That's control, it controls pace and mood, both speed and mood. Third function, third use of syntax in literature is it creates atmosphere, creates or recreates. When, when you look at something, when you, when you wasteland, for instance, T.S. Eliot, when, when he writes that, you, you, you would feel that he recreates. The, the atmosphere is recreated. Or, or uh, a passage to India, E.M. Foster, he recreates that. You see that. Or Orwell in 1984, he foretells, he sees, as a sci-fi by the way, uh, he, you can foresee what's going to happen. Right. Or use Verne's uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, that's again a scientific uh, uh, fiction, science fiction. You can almost foresee what's going to come. Right, all these are, uh, so they create atmosphere, they recreate atmosphere and you know what's going to come, what's in store for us and then you brace yourself up for that kind of a scenario. So that's, uh, those are the three uses of syntax in literature. One is, it produces rhetorical and aesthetic effects. Second, it controls your pace and mood. And third, it creates or recreates atmosphere. Some of the examples of syntax from literature, one, uh, let's say, Moby Dick. I have given an example. I have taken an example from Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Uh, Herman Melville. He says, call me Ish Ishmael. A famous line in literature is short and direct. He says, call me Ishmael. And then Melville says, another, another thing, another example is, whenever I find myself growing grim, whenever I find myself growing grim about the mouth, Whenever I, my, I find myself growing grim about the mouth or whenever it's a damp, dizzily November in my soul, right? Whenever it's a damp, dizzily November in my soul. Similarly, in Anna Karenina, Leo Tolstoy, he says, happy families are all alike. And that's a, look at the punctuation. He gives there, he says, happy families are all alike. And that's a colon, a semicolon. And he says, Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. There are, there are two parallel clauses here. One is happy families are all alike. Second clause is every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And they are joined by those two clauses are joined by a semicolon. And there he says these two sentences joined by a semicolon to show that these two thoughts are related and balanced. They are parallel, they are identical, but then they are balanced. One thing balances the other one. He says, happy families are all alike, and then he explains that every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Right. So, it, it's, it's a sort of justification of the statement that he makes, and that's, that's the purpose that this syntax effects in, creates effects in literature. Purpose of, some of the other purposes of syntax to study sentence structure. Now, at grammatical level, at basic mundane level, we look at the sentence structure, we, we see how sentences are framed, how subject verb agreement uh, happens, how subject follows the verb and then the object, and then each, each sentence, each uh, sentence starts with a capital Gee. letter and ends with a full okay. stop. Ends with a, yeah, please, please, please mute your mics. Okay. And, and then uh, it involves setting rules for creating coherent and grammatically correct sentences. Now, coherent and grammatically correct. A, a, a sentence will be correct in English only if it fulfills all the conditions the other class. If you 
uh, were there in that class on 2nd, 2nd of June, I had reiterated that a sentence will be considered, will be accepted only if it fulfills all the four conditions, not, not in a democratic manner that most of them, many of them, no, it has to fulfill all the four conditions. I gave you the example uh, of, ha, yeah, a, a colorless, colorless green ideas sleep furiously. If you say colorless green ideas sleep furiously, you cannot have something both colorless and green. You, you can't have both. You have to have, you can have either this or that. Similarly, ideas uh, is, a, is an abstract noun. It, it can't have, it, it should not have a color or colorlessness. Therefore, that also rule out. Then sleep is, a, is an act, is a verb that is associated with, that goes along with humans. Uh, trees don't sleep, uh, bottles don't sleep, computers don't sleep and all those. So that's why some, some living organism has to sleep and so that's sleep. And then furiously is an adverb that something which is an act, which is silent, which is quiet, which is where you close your eyes and then uh, fall flat, you, you don't have to be furious. Unless, of course, you are, you are making a lot of noise while sleeping. Generally, we don't do that. And, and that's why if somebody makes a lot of noise while sleeping, uh, somnam lokis, somnam bolis, all those, people take them to psychiatrists. If, if somebody walks while sleeping, somnam bolis. Or if somebody talks while sleeping, uh, somnam lokis. What happens? People will say he has sleep disorder, he has, uh, uh, he, he cannot sleep properly and so they take him to a psychiatrist or psychiatric consultant. Uh, we are talking of normal sleep. In normal sleep you don't have this thing. So all the four conditions, if something, a condition, all the four conditions have to be fulfilled in order to make something, uh, make a sentence acceptable. So it has to have uh, words, lexis, number of words. Second thing, it must rule, must follow the rules of syntax subject verb agreement subject verb object third it must follow grammar all the rules of grammar sentence must begin with a capital letter must end with a full stop all proper nouns must be capitalized a, an interrogative sentence must end with a question mark and all those then third uh, fourth is semantics it must be meaningful it can't be it 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 can't make something like this like we uh, we saw Clouds, we can't say clouds saw us, clouds see us, because we don't know whether they have eyes, whether they can see us, or they are not animate objects. They are abstract things, they, they are things that can't, they don't have life. Uh, so therefore we can't say, uh, man, cows eat grass, grass eats cows, right, it can't be. So that's why it must be, all the four conditions must be fulfilled in order for a sentence to be acceptable. Second one is, it involves setting rules for creating coherent and grammatical things. That's what it is. So it must have, must follow the rules, they must be coherent, they, are, they must be using proper word order, they must uh, use those phrases, clauses and all those, and they must be related to each other. You can't say uh, any, you can't put any words, any number of words together to form a sentence. There must be a pattern, there must be some rule, there must be some system where rules, one, one set of words or phrase, phrases, they, they are used in a context and they are related, they are related. Similarly, they, they another purpose, one more purpose of syntax is that it, the message, the efficacy of the message, the acceptability of the message, the veracity or the truthfulness of the message depends more heavily on strict syntax. If, if there is, uh, a wrong word order, if the word order is not perfect, if, if there is some discrepancy in the order of the words that we use in a sentence, they will also dilute the meaning, they will also affect the meaning, they will not make the sentence as meaningful as we would have expected them to become. One of the purposes of any communication is to, is to convey the message correctly. You, you can't uh, blurt out something and then tell that I was asked to convey the message and I did my job. No. It has to be conveyed exactly in the manner that you would have been asked to tell, so that there is no dilution between, there is no loss of transmission of the message. Whatever the messenger, whatever the 
whatever somebody asked you to deliver, you must deliver with that one. If you have seen in the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, Krishna, for instance, when he goes to the uh, Dhritarashtra's palace to convey the message, in fact, he himself offered to go and then uh, choose a, an agreement, choose a deal with the, with the Kauravas, just before the war was to, war was imminent anyway, so therefore, just before the war was to take place, the, the battle was to take place, he played the truce, he went to the palace and he conveyed the message exactly he wanted, did, without diluting a single syllable. Not even, forget about a word or a sentence. Even with a, without a syllable also, he did not miss a syllable also. So, that's it. Similarly, messengers in, in those times, they were asked to deliver exactly in the manner the message has to be conveyed, so that it does not dilute, it does not... Uh, miss out any information and, and therefore direct speech uh, in English plays that role. When you convey something to somebody exactly in the manner somebody would have told, you tell a direct speech. He said and I quote, right? He said and I quote. So let's say, uh, uh, let's say the American uh, freedom fighter, American freedom leader, their king, Martin Luther King the junior, he said, I have a dream. So he said, he said, and I quote, I have a dream. Or Jawaharlal Nehru said uh, uh, at freedom, on the freedom night, on the, on the uh, intervening nights of the freedom, 15th August, 15th, 16th August, 1960, 14th, 15th August, 1947, he said, we have a tryst with destiny. So that's, I quote that, which means you don't dilute any syllable exactly as somebody quoted. Example of uh, one syntax is, correct syntax examples include word choice, how you choose words. Right? So, that's diction. Which, which word will go with some, which word, how they will form sentence, how they will mean in that context, how, how they will convey the message, that's the word order, word choice. Second thing is matching number and tense. So, subject, verb, agreement, the number of the subject and number of the verb, then all those. Then third is placing the words and phrases in the right order. You, like in adverb for instance, if you have adverbs, in order, of, order in the adverb is, you have adverb of, let's say you have adverb of number, you have adverb of something. Uh, so that order you have to follow. And then uh, in, a, in the, the if, if you follow the pattern, if you follow those rules with regard to it, it can be anything. It may be adjectives, adverbs, word order, subject, verb. In the subject also you have, you have to have, you have to have adjectives and then after that, adjectives should come before the subject or the noun, and adverbs should come after the verb, and that's how that order. If you follow those orders, that makes the sentence, your sentence, simpler and comprehensible. Comprehensibility is a, is a big factor in any language. If whatever I tell is not comprehensible to you, if you are not able to follow that, then I miss out, then I don't, uh, then my language doesn't serve the purpose. Any language, as long as it conveys the idea right, it conveys the message, it intends to deliver. If, if it does that, then it succeeds, otherwise it fails. And, and a, a communication, a language, a, uh, any, in any context, if it doesn't fulfill the conditions, if it doesn't, it doesn't convey the message right, then it fails the duty, it fails the job. Then, uh, just, just uh, maybe we'll touch upon morphology for a while because that's also a part of that a part of so morphology is basically study of words like like linguistics is study of language morphology is study of words every single word how words are formed what do words do what do words have to do with sentences how do they how can morphology impact our sentence structure or our word building all those so in linguistics morphology is a study of words and how they are formed how their relationships to other words are in language and so language in language, in English, in any language, and for that, and uh, more particularly in English, uh, we recognize the relationship between words. The, the morphology helps us identify or see the words. So if you say, that's a like boy, one, one single boy. If you make it plural, it becomes boys. So that S, adding of S makes it a plural. It's more number more than two two or more, it can be a billion also. Similarly, similarly, tense. If you say, uh, start, we start, we started the class. So, 
past tense. ED, ED makes it a, makes it past tense. So there you know that it's a past tense. And even without looking at the dictionary, looking at the, uh, looking at any, any other source, just by hearing that word also you can know that it's a past tense of want or wo start. There is a plural of boy. Uh, this is the ing form of something else. So let's say swimming is a good exercise. Now swim, ing is actually uh, can be used or can be seen as as a let's say progress in the progressive form. We use ing. They are going. We are playing. But then that is also whenever it's added to a verb, an ing particle is added to a verb, and it functions as a noun. That becomes a gerund. So. Uh, Swimming, for instance, is a gerund. It's a verb, swim, plus ing, and the function is noun. So swimming is a good exercise. Swimming is a noun there. And morphology, it, 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 helps, it helps us identify the words to see how words are formed, how words are combined to uh, form more words. So when you have two, two words combined together, they give you a phrase, and they can be a uh, they they are new words. We call them neology neologism also. When now let's say for instance portmanteau words. When you when you see portmanteau words, those are combined. Those are made up of two or parts of two or more words, right? Parts of two or more words. For X or branch or COVID idiot, COVID idiot. Those who, are, who behave like idiots in a COVID situation are COVID idiots, right? So. Those are, uh, th that's, that's a new word. COVID word is a portmanteau word. Similarly, COVID warrior is a new phrase made up of two words. COVID is a, is a disease. Uh, warrior is somebody who fights the disease and therefore we say COVID warrior. Doctors, nurses, health workers, all of them are COVID warriors now. Police, police and then uh, all healthcare uh, workers, police, firemen, all those people we call them COVID warriors. Right? So that's that's another word we form and these words are formed by taking into by adding by drawing new words from other sources or by taking existing words or by changing existing words it can be anything now in a in a case like let's say brunch we have already breakfast was a word lunch was a word we put parts of this word these two words together and gave a new word brunch so that's a different thing but or in a in a, in a covid year we had a word like idiot already. COVID was a new word. Part of this word, part of that word we put together, gave a new word. So it can be from existing things. It can be from new words. It can be, it can be devised from the, uh, because society, uh, because language is a dynamic thing. It's not static. It's, it evolves. Every, every now and then it, it changes, it evolves, it grows. And as, as we grow, as we grow old, language also grows and grows old. And it goes along with us because that's a part of a society. And since society evolves, society progresses, society is dynamic, any part of society, including language, also has to grow and, and evolve. We can't be using the language that Shakespeare used or, or, or uh, Chaucer used or T.S. Eliot used. We use language whatever suits our needs today. We cannot use the language that suited them then, 100 years ago, 500 years ago, right? We, we use language to suit our purpose, to suit our times, to, su to suit our needs. And depending on our needs, depending on the time, our needs also change. And therefore, to, in order to, in order to uh, adapt to the changing scenario, we also change the language and their function and their usage, and that's how we use new words. So that's, that was morphology. Now coming to morphology and syntax. Uh, because just, just before this we had a discussion about syntax, so we should also understand the difference between or relationship between morphology and syntax. Morphology, you, as you understand, is study of language. Syntax is the arrangement of words in a sentence. Fine? Both of them have something common, words. In morphology, you study words, how they are formed, how they are generated, how they function, how words come into being how they change their shape and size and form and all those, all those are all morphology. Syntax is how they are used in a context or in a sentence. So word order is one of the functions. Uh, which word comes where? You know that subject comes here, verb comes in the middle, object comes later. So that's the, that's the syntax or that's the order.
but but the relationship between both of them uh, is is very strong unless you have uh, unless you follow the morphological structure of words or the rules of morphology you can't also follow you can't go to the morphology syntax both of them are related it's it's like this if 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 uh, we go to a doctor go to a, a dentist for instance complaining about a tooth or teeth the first thing that uh, the dentist will say is he will ask is, what happened? Why have you come to me? You say, this, this tooth or these teeth are paining, troubling me. Then he, he won't say that, okay, uh, we'll remove all the teeth. Because your, your tooth or teeth are paining, we'll remove all the teeth so that you don't get any pain. He won't say that. He will say, show me the teeth. Which tooth or which teeth are paining or troubling? Then you identify one of those teeth. Out of those 32, or whatever is remaining, uh, out of 32, if, you are, if all the teeth are intact, that's good. In case something is missing, then out of the remaining things, 30. So he will identify only those, that or those tooth or teeth, and then say, uh, it, it has a cavity, or uh, it needs root canal treatment, or it needs extraction, or, or I'll give you a painkiller and then manage with this for one week, in case it doesn't become you, you can't tolerate, then we will try something else, right? He doesn't say, okay, we remove all the teeth now and then you go home and for the rest of your life you will not have any, any problem at all with regard to teeth or tooth, right? No, he won't say that. So that's it. In the sentence we won't say, no, no, because this war, this war uh, doesn't fit here or this war is, is not right, so we will throw away this war. No, in that context that may not have function, but somewhere else that may have a, a better role and that's the only word that can be used there, no other word can find replacement there, right? If you say, let's say, word like resplendent. Now, you can't, you can't say resplendent in a, in a very small, ordinary thing like this. Grass is resplendent, right? That, that, that has some, some bigger purpose, some bigger meaning. So morphology and syntax are an integral part of linguistics. And uh, when <coughs> morphology, while morphology deals with uh, the underlying understanding of how words are formed, formed, so how each word is formed, etymology, what are the things that they take to, to change their shape and size and color and then number and all those. That's one part. Syntax is focused on the way, syntax focuses on the way sentences are developed. This pertains to word, that pertains to sentence. Basically, morphology is the study of structure of words and syntax is the study of the structure of sentences. Right? That's, that's the basic difference, word and sentence. Uh, other examples could be table, kind, and jump. So another type is function, morphemes, and all those. So examples include those. Now when you, when you add, when you try uh, identifying examples of a morphology, it's a table. So it can be tabular is, a, is another word formed out of table. Table is root word, noun. Tabular is adjective. You, you add an AR, that becomes a new word. So table becomes tabular, that's a new word, a new form also. This is noun, that is adjective. And uh, similarly, uh, similarly, table and tables. It's singular, that's plural, just by adding an S. Or even in some cases, we don't even add S. We just change their, change their like, women and women, for instance. Woman, a single woman, and women, that's plural. We just change one letter there. Somewhere we don't even change. Well, some, some plurals, so sheep, for instance, Sheep, we don't change, we don't say sheeps. Five, sheep, SHIP, sheep is different. I am talking of sheep, SHEEP. We don't put an S there to say that this is plural of the other uh, S, other uh, sheep, one, one uh, sheep and then two or more sheeps. Right, now uh, when, when we look at the uh, syntax and, and morphology, that, that gives us that, that tells us how uh, words are formed or sentences are, are formed or how each word has some role to play, each word has some role to play in, uh, uh, in making a sentence and that word of course will, will also uh, govern the way the, the following words change their uh, pattern or change their uh, or, or effect any changes. So let's say if the subject is singular uh, and the verb is in the uh, present tense, 
and number of the subject is third person, it takes S or ES. So that's, that's how we say uh, he loves poetry. If you say he, and in the present tense, the, uh, that love takes S. So that's how we say he loves poetry. Similarly, <coughs> similarly, but then if you say, if you add somebody else with he, he and she, then that love be, loves become, becomes love. He, they love poetry. You say he loves poetry, she loves poetry, but I love poetry, they love poetry. That's because uh, they, these subjects, the plural, number of plural, if the subject is plural or I, I also, even though it's singular, I also doesn't take S or ES. So I, I don't, right? We love. I love poetry. That's that's how uh, number uh, affects the use of the syntax. Then, uh, if you, if you come to the accent part, that maybe a part of them I can um, touch upon just to rewind, just to sum up what we had done in the uh, few classes that we had in the last month and part of this month. We can have a run through of them just to get an idea of how uh, accent makes um, or, or uh, affects or impacts the meaning of meanings of words. In, a, uh, the, in one of my earlier lectures, I believe that was in the last week, uh, in the last month, that was in May, some class in May, I think, I had detailed, given a detailed uh, list of words that, that function, that change their uh, function only by changing the accent, the place of the accent. Uh, the general rule though is that subject, the nouns, nouns and or adjectives, they uh, in most cases they take the accent in the first syllable and the verbs take the accent in the second syllable. Some examples I can give you off the cuff right now, say for instance uh, uh, object, so it, it's a nice object. Object is noun there, therefore it takes the accent in the first syllable. Uh, if you use it as a verb, it, the accent shifts to the second position, second syllable. So I object your honor, right? In the course and although they say I object your honor. Similarly, conduct. He is known for his good conduct. They are noun, but then uh, you must conduct yourself is verb. Uh, listen to listen to this. Conduct is noun. Conduct is verb. Similarly, absent or desert, or convict. He he is a he is a uh, convict in this case. But then he is convicted of of a crime there. So second one is a verb. Similarly, uh, import. India imports, right? India imports uh, respirators. India imports respirators from the U.S. But then. Uh, if you use it as a noun, it becomes, uh, or adjective also, adjective will be imported. So uh, imported, imported, uh, imported goods are, are of high demand in India. So if you say it's, it's made in, in China or made in Malaysia, made in the US, so that has a lot of demand. So you say imported goods have a lot of demand in India, but we import uh, lots of medicines to the world. So that's how, that's verb. Second, in the compound words where the first elements are accented, some words like crossword, there the accent is on the first syllable, cross, or pickpocket, he is a pickpocket, or postman, uh, postman visits us every day, or in, in the compound words with ever, self, and all those, however, and herself, and all those, we, the accent is on the second component, the second part of the word, so herself, or whatever may be the case, we don't say whatever, we say whatever may be the case, I will go there. Themselves, they themselves were to blame for this. And in compound words again, there are another, uh, there is another set of compound words where both the elements are accented. Of course, one element, one of them has to be secondary, has to have a secondary stress. So afternoon, we say good afternoon, now it's afternoon, 12, po po past 12. 12, 10. So, good afternoon. He is a bad tempered man. Or, our vice chancellor is visiting the campus tomorrow. Or, this is a homemade pickle. So, homemade. Similarly, uh, there are 
uh, all of you are able to hear hello yes sir yes sir ah, very very good very good uh, the, uh, silence speaks volumes so uh, but then sometimes there has to be some some uh, responses from the other end to make us feel that it's not a one way uh, traffic people are there on the other side they are also uh, listening they are also mm, they may be taking down notes or they have they are taking down questions so that's uh, that's why i just thought of checking whether people are listening okay how many uh, how many students are there by the way today how many participants are there sir 29 students are okay 29 29 includes you and me and everybody you me and uh, this barik babu also yes sir yes sir okay uh fine so words with weak prefixes weak prefixes are let's say abroad or abroad or ahead he is going ahead of me or or below from from above the from above the sky the the clouds below looked like cauliflowers so below similarly uh in instructional uh, suffixes where words end in uh past tense and and plural numbers and ing and all those they do not change they remain the same solicit solicited or uh, focus focuses submit submitted or uh, ad, uh, advance advancing or region reasoning so they they remain the they remain constant they don't change but in derivational cases derivational suffixes like uh, like age ance er ure h o o d and all those where uh, we have the words ending in these elements they again they also normally do not change the accent they remain the same so carry carriage or bright brighten or or uh, actor actress or brother brotherhood or collect collector or or city citizen or laugh laughter or color colorless in all these cases they remain constant they don't change even if they are uh, they we add those particles to form new words derivatives to form new words they still remain the same accent doesn't change similarly uh, in uh, the another set of examples where words end in ion their accent is on the penultimate last but one ultimately the last syllable penultimate last but one element so let's say admiration or falsification or determination so de determination nation so it falls on nation nay is that is that part all the penultimate last but one asian is the asian is the last one so this falls just before that and similarly words ending in ic ical i c a l l y i a l i l l y and all those ending in those suffixes they are accented on the syllable preceding the suffix suffix is i c let us say or i c a l a l so these words end there so let's say uh, ap apologetic so apologetic or terrific or biological biological or or dictatorial commercial so in a word like commercial for instance so commercial we don't put accent on the curve, first first part of the word comer it's the second part commercial so or, or categorically he categorically denied his involvement in the case and words ending in ity they take the accent on the anti penultimate third from the left ultimate then penultimate before that third from the left would be anti penultimate a n t e anti penultimate so ability generosity magnanimity and these these sounds are opportunity so they they determine how these sounds uh take the accent on the word on the part or the of the aspect on the uh, element which is third from the left ultimate penultimate then uh, anti penultimate okay and then uh, let's have a look at the intonation also quickly and then we will give you we will give you 5 uh, minutes yeah another 4 5 minutes maybe we can have question 
answer. Uh, there are there are four international. By the way, again, just just a quick recap of what we had done in a couple of in the previous uh, classes. Intonation is the melodic pattern of an utterance. So you have a rhythmic pattern. You have a, a beat, regular beats. You you pronounce words at regular intervals of time, and that gives you the beat, and so that gives you the musical effect of the sentence that you make, you and I make. So something like this: when you say "twinkle, twinkle, little star," so it it's a, it has a regular beat, and that beat gives us the uh, time. It takes almost the uniform time, almost the same time, you know, producing a twinkle and that little star. So, in some case, we may have to uh, we may have to collapse two or more elements together. In some cases, we may have to split that, but then that takes approximately the same time, so that it's a regular beating, stress time pattern beating, and uh, is a melodic pattern of an utterance, and it's primarily a matter of variation in the pitch level of the voice. So you high pitch, low pitch, medium pitch and all those. But in such languages as English, stress and rhythm are also involved. Not only the intonation, we have also word stress, we have also uh, accent and rhythm, we have those suprasegmental features, prosodic features, and then uh, weak, weak forms, weak, weak vowels, weak sounds, and they all of them contribute to the rhythmic pattern of English, and intonation adds to that also, and that's why it becomes, uh, it gives us that effect, it gives us that spiritual effect. Uh, intonation conveys differences of expressive meaning, surprise, anger, weariness and all those. There are basically four types of intonations, falling tone, rising tone, falling rising and rising falling. Now falling tone is from you, you make a statement at a high pitch and then fall down. So in a statement like this, the postman was looking for you. It's a matter of fact statement, so the postman was looking for you. You, you fall down from, from high to fall low, you fall and therefore uh, that indicates that you it's a matter of fact or in a question like when will he come you that's also you are you are not insisting on uh, when and all those you know just just making a, a flat question asking a simple question like when will he come uh, but then if you say when will he come you are insisting on he you are talking of when will he come not I'm not asking about she I'm not asking about somebody else right similarly when will he come if you insist on come again, if you stress on come, I'm not asking about go, I'm not asking about eat, I'm asking about come, when will he come? So that's, that depends on the context and that depends on uh, the relevance. So where, in which case are you talking about that, who are the people involved, what is the context that, that you are a part of and all those things will, will uh, contribute to, to the meaning that you derive from using a particular intonation. So in the falling tone, you have all these things from uh, you fall from high to fall. So statements, WH questions, questions beginning with WH words or yes or no type questions, any question beginning with an auxiliary, any of those 25 auxiliaries that I had listed out in one of my earlier lectures last month and then or tag questions. It's a lovely day. It's a lovely day, isn't it? Or commands or requests by one or exclamations. How surprising. Similarly, falling tones are used again from high to, this is high fall, that was low fall, this is high fall. Rising tone will be from low to high. So, statements, no, perhaps, or WH questions, when can you go? Or yes or type questions, is he working? Or tag questions like, he didn't do it, did he? Or commands would be, take this. Exclamations could be, best of luck. And rising falling, rising tone, uh, rising falling tone could be something like this. This is associated with questions like, so some, when you say, uh, when somebody asks you, what are you eating? You say, toast. Then did you say toast? Do you want some toast kind of meaning? Or I saw a snake. So if you say snake, what? Snake, so that's it. Falling rising tone would be, falling rising tone would be something like, do you play tennis? Sometimes, oh yes. So, is, is, is you are telling well, well, yes kind of thing. You are not turning down, you are not agreeing. Because if you say yes, then they will ask you to play a match. You don't want to do that. So, you say, well, sometimes, so which means you are not a professional. And falling rising would be something like, 
if somebody asks you, do we agree? Say, uh, yes. So, because you don't have to lose anything there. You don't lose anything there by agreeing to somebody or something. You say, uh, if somebody asks you something, do you agree with me? You say, yes. Or, or are you sure this will go? So, you, you almost agree. You don't, you don't deny. You don't turn down. Right. Now, when, when you uh, use a particular intonation, you convey a certain mood. And that mood determines, that mood tells you how you, uh, what you intend, uh, what you intend to convey, how your mood is, what, what exactly uh, the state of mind you are in, and all those things. Okay. That's all for today then. Five, five, five minutes or something, we can have questions and answers. Hiba, yes? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. If any question, anything is there, we can discuss. Uh, so I would request the participants to, if you would be able to kindly interact with the resource person, that would be well and good. But I'm having few questions, sir. Hmm. Hello? Am I audible, yeah. sir? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yes, sir. Um, Mukesh Rao is asking that... Uh, what is object in the sentence? Oh, which sentence? Just a sentence. Uh, Achha, any, sentence. any sentence. Last, last part of the sentence is if we have a, if the verb is transitive, then the last part of the, after, whatever comes after the verb is the object. So, something like this. We, uh, we eat apples. So, we is subject, eat is... Uh, yes, ma'am. What is object in a sentence? Ah, okay, good. Uh, in, a, in a sentence like this, we eat apples. You are able to hear me, all of you? Yes, sir. Ah, good. Uh, in a sentence like we eat apples or they are, they are playing golf, they is subject, are playing is verb, golf is object. We eat apples, we is subject, eat is verb, apples is object. Or they are they watched movies they is subject watched is verb movies is object whatever comes after the verb is object if the verb is transitive if the verb is intransitive then you don't need any object don't have any object okay yes sir thank yes. you sir. okay sir so i would request the participant if they are having any queries what are the rules of object in sentences Achha, what are the rules of object in sentences? Mm. They, they, as, as you know, just, just now we did syntax, right? In syntax, what, are the, what is the construction of a sentence? Arrangement of words in a sentence, you have subject, you have verb, and you have object. Fine. In the subject, you may have, a subject may be made up of adjectives, articles, determinants, and all those, plus noun and verb, noun and or verb. All those things put together is subject. Similarly, verb also, whatever the root verb, root word verb plus the, the uh, tense, the form of the verb, it, it may have a uh, helping verb, an auxiliary verb, a modal, and an ing form, past tense form, all those put together is verb. And then whatever comes after the verb is the object. Right? Yeah. Yes, sir, yes. What else? Participants, if you are having any queries, then please do ask the resource person directly. Just one by one, don't create hustle over there. Right? Yes. Yeah, one question I'm having, sir. Uh, Dolomani Thapa is asking, what's the difference between syntax and semantics? Semantics is the, is the meaning part. Syntax is the structure part. In when you have a when you have a sentence like this, we we uh, read novels. Syntax is we is subject, read is verb, novels is object. That subject, verb, order, object, that arrangement. The whole thing is syntax because this is plural and in the present tense, therefore it doesn't take S or ES. So it becomes read and the novels is plural, then it ends with a full stop. 
the sentence starts with a capital letter, all those that syntax. Semantics is meaning. Whatever somebody, whenever somebody hears this sentence, he or she will ask you, how many novels have you read? Which novel did you read last? What is the lat latest novel uh, you have read? Do you read Chetan Bhagat? Uh, have you, have you uh, uh, seen, have you met uh, Ashwin Sanghi? All those things they will ask. Right. So that's meaning because they know they will mean, they will understand the meaning that you read novels and these are the novelists, Chetan Bhagat and Ashwin Sanghi are novelists and therefore they will ask you, have you ever read uh, Chetan Bhagat's novels or have you uh, come across, uh, have you met Ashwin Sanghi and all those. Thank you, sir. Okay. Any more questions, participants? Else we will be winding up the session. Please do interact with the resource person. Today's class was uh, really very complicated one. So please do ask your question if you're having any queries. Yeah, one is asking what are der derivatives? Dolomini Thapa is asking what are derivatives? Uh, derivatives are those parts, those particles that are added to words to form new words. You have inflections, inflections and derivatives. So th those two ways we, we get, we find form new words. We derive, yes. derivatives are noun, derive is the verb. We derive one, one more word from the existing word by adding something, by changing something and that's it. Then uh, what is gerund? Uh, gerund is a verb plus ing functioning as a noun. When a verb is, when there's a verb like swim, you add an ing to that, that becomes swimming and swimming is a noun. Swimming is a good exercise. In this sentence, it's a noun. But he has, he has gone swimming, he or he, they are swimming in the pool, they are swimming is verb. They are swimming in the pool, swimming is verb there, but swimming is a good exercise, swimming is a noun here because it is the verb plus ing and it, it is used in the place of the noun or the subject position here in this sentence, subject swimming is a good exercise, swimming is placed in the subject position in this sentence, therefore it is a noun, it is a gerund, okay then. Uh, I would request uh, Pragyan from Paramita Nayak to kindly ask your question directly as the person is uh, concerned about the grammatical foundation, how to increase one grammatical foundation or the basics, that is his concern. Achha, for uh, grammar, I think if you want to improve your basic grammar, you should follow a book like uh, Remedial English Grammar by F.T. Wood, F.T.W.O.O.D. Wood. Or if you uh, need some advanced uh, grammar intervention, you should follow Quark and Greenbaum. English grammar by Quark, Q-U-I-R-K and Greenbaum, G-R-E-E-N-B-A-U-M. Or, or uh, Green, David Green also is one more grammar book, Intermediate English Grammar, David Green. That's also a good, good one with lots of examples. With, with plenty of examples and that will help you understand. Yes, sir. Uh, may I ask the question, sir? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes. Sir. Our family route is asking a question. Can we make the sentence without using object before transitive verb? Can uh, we make if, sentence? Yeah. Uh, no, one, one rule, I flat rule I said, I made that if the verb is transitive, you have to have, a, have an object. If you don't want object, then that uh, verb, you use an intransitive verb. So something like, something like, let's say, dance, something like swim, swim, dance, dream, sleep, uh, hop, jump. In all these cases, you don't have to, you don't need any object. But then in some, in, uh, there are ditransitive words also where you, have the option of either using uh, an object or not using. Those are those cases you can have. So seeing for instance, seeing, he sings, you can stop at that. But you can also say he sings uh, songs. 
right so those are the, that's a possibility yes yes sir participants if you are having any queries are you having any queries mukesh raut please ask your question directly to the resource person yes ma'am yeah yes cow eat grass subject plus helping verb plus object yes or no uh no number 1 uh, you are doing ma or ba ha mukesh na question mukesh answer the question whether you are ma or ba mukesh Mukesh, kindly unmute your mic and answer the question asked by the resource person: whether you are bachelor's degree program learner or master's degree program learner. Am I audible to you, Mukesh? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, answer the question. Answer it. What What are you doing? What What's your program? BA or MA? MA. MA. Very good. Now uh, look at the question. Uh, repeat that question. Hmm. Cow eats grass. Subject grass, plus okay. helping verb, verb plus object. Yes or no? Ah. No. Look. Yes. Look. It can't. It can't be a yes/no type question. Your your question has to be clear. What what exactly do you want to ask? If subject hmm. in this case cow is cow is singular, right? Right. Correct. Uh, correct. Correct. Cow sir. is singular. Ah. Huh. Cow is singular. Third person. Therefore. This sentence is correct. Yes or no? Yes. Cow eats yes. grass. Is right. If you say cow eat grass is wrong. If you say cow eats grass is wrong. If you say cow eats grass, that's the only right thing. Eats grass. Okay, then. Any more questions, participants? Participants, are you having any more questions? They are done. Okay, sir. <laughs> sir, uh, what is the difference between morph and morpheme? Mor morpheme is a like in the in the phoneme in the phonology or phonetics. Phoneme is a is a is independent right? Like, smallest sound. Smallest sound of uh, unit is called morpheme. Is phoneme in morpheme also similarly smallest part of the word. So when you break a word into two parts, that is from the phonetics point of view if you break that becomes a syllable if you discuss it from the uh, word structure point of view morphology point of view that becomes a morpheme so okay. uh, which means when you break a word like let's say let's say telephone right so tele and then phone those two words those that tele is a morpheme and phone is a morpheme and in if you discuss it from phonetics point of view telephone tele Those are that's a syllable. Te is a syllable. La is a syllable. And phone is one syllable. So you have three syllables there. But you have two morphemes here. They are independent. This tele, if you add to something else also, can form a new word. Can give you a new word. So tele, phone, tele, pathy, tele, uh, consultation, tele, medicine. All those. The second half of those words are are uh, words. And this tele, if you add to them, they give you a different meaning. A different meaning. A, a different, uh, an independent word. So telephone, telepathy, telemedicine, teleconsultation, right? Telegraph. Thank you, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. So I would like to thank on the behalf of the all the participants and the university for taking this great opportunity for taking the classes in this lockdown session and the or the unlocked session. It's really very quite helpful for the learners, and we are looking forward for more such sessions. So please do take more such sessions for the participants. And we are today's session was really very insightful, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you. If Thank you have you uh, participants, yes, if you have any doubt, you can ask Heba, ma'am. She is around you. I am away from you, so you can't ask me. You can ask Heba. She is also good in linguistics and phonetics. She can help you out. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. So I would request the participants to kindly.